it is with particular pleasure. We're particularly pleased that we have a new pro director who is a migration specialist. And on behalf of the centre, I'd like to welcome Professor Richard Black to SOAS. And as I said, we clap if you want. As well. <laughs> I, I, I said to Richard just before we started, it's a bit of a sort of a double-edged tool inviting him to so as asking him to give a lecture, but uh, we're all keen to hear what he has to say. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about him, Richard is a geographer by training. He completed his undergraduate degree in, in geography at Oxford and then a, did a PhD at Royal Hol Holloway. So he has uh, worked in London before. And he actually taught at King's College between 1989 and 1995. But he really is a Sussex man. He's been there since 1995 and held a post of Professor of Geography since 2003. Um, Richard headed the Sussex Centre for Migration Research, which over the last decade has produced extremely important uh, uh, research reports on a number of issues. And not only that, but trained a number of numerous practitioners and other academics who've come from that centre. Between 2003 and 2009, he was the director of the Development Research Centre on Migration, Globalisation and Poverty, which had DFID funding. And very much what those research projects were about was looking at migration from a different perspective, really moving away from migration as maybe being the result of underdevelopment, to looking to how migration is actually much more complex and also works as a, an engine to get people out of poverty. So it was research which was undertaken in order to try and make migration as beneficial as possible for those uh, the poorest in society. Richard then went on to become head of the School of Global Studies. It always sounds to me like you've been made supreme ruler of the universe when uh, people say that title, <laughs> Global Studies, yeah, uh, which was established at Sussex in 2009. Uh, and Professor Black's research focuses not only on international migration, but forced migration and post-conflict return as well, as, as well as the related social and economic and by environmental transformations. One of the most interesting um, areas he's been researching recently is to look at the environmental impact and what, that happens, what happens to migration patterns in those circumstances. And that's led to a, a number of uh, important recent publications. He was also editor of the Journal of Refugee Studies from 1994 to 2009, as well as a part of an EU-funded project on migration from Africa to Europe, which he did between 2009 and 2012. So he's no slouch, our new pro-director, and I, I'm sure he's going to bring some of that energy to, to SOAS. But from 2012, he's been heading the uh, project Migrating Out of Poverty, which is a, a, a research consortium which includes universities from South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Bangladesh, and Singapore. And he's also won many awards, including the Royal Geographical Society's Back Award for Contributions to Public Policy, and in 2012, Richard was elected academician of the Royal Academy of, excuse me, the Ac Academy of Royal Science. So I can't speak, sorry, just excuse me. I'm going to take a breath and start again. Uh, uh, the, <coughs> the Academy of Social Sciences. There, I got it out. Okay. So you can see by looking at his body of work that Richard is in a part of an important group of scholars who have helped establish migration studies in the UK and also been a signif significant voice in migration policy in the UK and beyond. And um, actually looking at this body of work, I thought it really exemplifies how far migration research has come in the last two decades. Um, you know, we're now used to analysing things in much more complex terms, which I think why things like David Cameron's intervention is, is so frustrating, because in, it, it suggests two things to me. In a way, we've come a long way. We understand migration in much more complex ways than we did before. But there's still maybe an ongoing gap that is a problem for migration researchers between what we talk about in universities and policy initiatives and the very narrow binary narratives which still dominate public debate, which are often uh, centred on very simplistic arguments, and I think we're all aware and worry about how maybe we can transform that relationship between what's happening in the academy and what's happening at, at ground level. So, in relation to what Richard is addressing tonight, uh, at the moment he's conducting research on immigrant integration in the UK, particularly relating to recent Eastern European migration and also African migration to this country, which I think is what you're talking about, roughly. I was interested to see that in his abstract, uh, Professor Black has diaspora and in inverted commas. I'm not really sure what that uh, refers to. But, and also the other thing, uh, I thought we had an email exchange about which of two talks he was going to do. And uh, the first one, which you actually said was your preference, was uh, much based much more on modelling. Uh, but Richard was worried that it would not be suitable for a SOAS audience. Okay, so I don't know what that says about us, but we're we're made of stern stuff. I think we can we can take it. 
Um, so the title of Richard's talk tonight is Super Diversity and Super Mobility. Is there an order to migration? And what he's going to be looking at is this, um, what's been becoming apparent more and more in the last couple of decades, which is that migrant forms of migration are becoming increasingly diverse uh, and, and increasing in numbers. And on the other hand, borders are increasingly being closed down. Uh, so what happens in that situation? Because migration doesn't stop. It takes other forms and it develops in new ways. Uh, so I think that's what Richard will be talking tonight, and especially how migration flows are connected to local conditions and, and dictated in large part by local job markets, but also local policies towards uh, immigration control. So I will hand over to Richard now. He'll be talking to us for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session afterwards. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Paru, for those very kind words. And... Um, I'd, I'd like to start with a couple of apologies. And the first apology is that I'm not going to talk about um, migration and development, nor indeed am I going to talk about migration and environment. They're, they're both topics on which I have done quite a lot of work and which I'm very interested. Um, but I, was, um, uh, I felt challenged to try and address the diaspora issue as I'm speaking to a Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies. Um, and there's no particular uh, meaning to putting diaspora in. Um, in parentheses, um, I um, so linked to that a, a second apology is that this is very much an experimental talk. As Parry said, I suggested two um, possible talks. The, the the one that was my preference. I'm actually glad in a way that I didn't do that because that was a modelling heavy presentation that that I do want to do as my work has started moving a little bit more towards uh, modelling. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know there is, a, there is a logistic regression model in what I have to tell you tonight, but only one. So it's a little bit experimental, and so I apologise in advance if I either go really short in terms of the amount of time that it takes to get through this talk, or indeed end up rushing at the end, because I haven't given, it th I haven't given this talk ever before, and, I, and I'm working a little bit on exactly how long it's going to last. And then the, the final apology I wanted to make is... Um, to my, my colleagues who've been working with me on this. Um, uh, as the head of a school and dean of a faculty is the equivalent here, or a pro-director, uh, the time available to actually do research, of course, gets uh, whittled away at all ends, and it is some time since I have personally been in the field talking to migrants, which is something that I both like to do and think is crucially important if you are going to talk about a subject that you have some connection with the uh, the subjects um, themselves. But inevitably, my work over the last few years has moved into more collaborative projects. Uh, I found that quite an exciting thing to do too, indeed collaborating with people who think about the world in completely different ways to me, including uh, economic and climate modelers, who are some of the people that I've been working with recently. But I do need to apologise to them because uh, what I present that is essentially the outcome of our joint work, and in some cases really their work, um, I may not present it entirely the way that they would do. And the people I should give a name check to are, first of all, uh, my colleagues in the MAFE project, the Migration from Afri Africa to Europe project, which is, is a collaborative European project uh, coordinated by the um, National Demographic uh, uh, Studies Institute in Paris, uh, involving a number of different European and African institutions. Uh, over the last four years, which is a project that actually has uh, only recently come to an end and on which we are uh, still publishing, and that's one of the reasons why it's uh, very much in my mind. Uh, one of my uh, tasks last week and this when I was not thinking about the REF, which incidentally is submitted, yay, <laughs> submitted, um, was uh, to try and progress a, a paper on uh, what explains migration from Ghana um, that we're hoping to send off fairly soon, and some of that is is in here. And, and the second group of people that I want to give a name check to is uh, some of my uh, absolutely brilliant PhD students that I've had the privilege of working with over the last few years at Sussex, who've taken an amazingly um, diverse set of approaches uh, to uh, migration, which I have struggled to keep up with in many uh, respects. So the people whose work I'm going to feature in this talk include uh, Fran Meissner, who's now working at the European University Institute, who's done some different kind of modelling um, of the homophily, homophily, homophily of social networks. We'll get to that at the end. Um, 
Prosper Asima, who's now at the Centre for Migration Studies in Ghana, as well as still working for the Ghanaian government, which is what he was doing before he did his PhD, uh, whose work was on gender and migration amongst Ghanaians in the UK and back in Ghana, and David Rubian Ling, who's uh, just finished his PhD, although it's yet to be vivid, on Sierra Leonean diaspora communities again in London and back in Sierra Leone. So what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is to set out some ideas that is based on this diverse uh, set of work and try and draw some connections between them, in particular in relation to two bodies of literature that I think are developing at the moment, um, and uh, which I'm interested in, one on supermobility uh, and the other on super diversity. And, and I hope, uh, although I hadn't actually read um, David Cameron's comments this morning, I, I try not to read David Cameron's comments actually, <laughs> um, um, but I hope that what I have to say will have uh, some relevance to the current debates about immigration in the UK because I think that there, there is actually a genuine concern um, not uh, limited to sections of the Conservative Party uh, but actually more widespread in UK society including various fractions of UK society that maybe migration is somehow getting out of control and notions like super diversity and super mobility can be read in a positive way, but they can also be read in a negative way. Um, the impression that if things are getting so complex that maybe that complexity means that they are beyond understanding and in that sense beyond our control and therefore uh, constitute a worry in terms of public policy and the future of society. And I want to try and address that by asking the question of whether there is still some order to migration in the world, in particular uh, migration from Africa to Europe and from other places uh, to the UK, uh, whether this is a manageable thing or not. So that's broadly speaking what I want to try and do. Let, let me see if I can do it. So let me start um, with what do I mean by super diversity and super mobility and, and why should they be connected? I mean, at one level, of course, you can't live in London without hearing about and seeing its growing diversity. Paru said that a, um, a number of years back I was a student in London and I also worked uh, in London at the beginning of my academic career. And at that time I lived in uh, Hackney, uh, I think probably still the most diverse uh, borough in London. At that time there were already over 100 languages spoken in Hackney that Hackney Council had to deal with in terms of translation services. Uh, in order to service its very diverse uh, population, and that was 20 years ago. Um, and even at that time, uh, London, of course, was a hub for uh, diverse world music, cultural and artistic events, just as it is today. And um, I don't know if any of you went to hear Manu Dibango at the uh, Barbican last night. Um, I was hoping that I was going to go, but unfortunately didn't. Um, of course, London is a vibrant, diverse, interesting city. Um, but the argument about superdiversity is that there is something new about this diversity, or at least an e increasing recognition that diversity itself is multidimensional. So it's superdiversity is not just about there being lots of uh, different cultures and languages in London. It is something more than that. And of course, it's uh, the anthropologist Steve Vertevec who's tr tried to theorise this as superdiversity, not just diversity based on ethnic or national origin, but also on diversity of religions, diversity of migrant trajectories, diversity of legal statuses, diversity of workplaces, indeed also diversity in the workplace. Um, and if true, that's important because we tend to think of diversity primarily, I would say, in terms of uh, ethnicity or national origin, or at most in religious terms, yet this does not encompass, at least according to Steve, uh, does not encompass the full nature of actual and potential cleavages in current society in the UK. So that's super diversity. I'll come back to it a little bit more detail in, in a bit. But what about super mobility and why talk about these two phenomena uh, together? Well, in some senses, I suppose you could argue that the flip side of super diversity is super mobility. It's not just that people in some places, the, particularly the big global cities like London, New York, Toronto, have come there from a variety of other places uh, through various routes, um, but also an argument that migration itself has become more diverse. 
with people less tied to one particular place. Now, of course, the notion that people are less tied to one particular place um, is also associated, at least in part, with another concept that Steve Vertovec was uh, prominent in championing uh, a decade or so ago, uh, the concept of transnationalism, which I'm sure will be familiar to all of you. This is the notion that people's social, economic and political worlds increasingly transcend national borders. Indeed, we might say that Steve's observations on superdiversity derive from his and others' observations on transnationalism a few years earlier, and on which now there is, of course, a very big literature. Yet it seems that there is something more going on here. Um, uh, transnationalism, interesting as that literature is, I would say, very often still refers to individuals who might previously have lived, say, um, uh, moved, say, from Mexico to the US or from Turkey to Germany along one of those migration corridors that we're familiar with, um, who are now living transnational lives that involve living in Mexico and the US simultaneously, whether physically or emotionally, um, perhaps also somewhere else at the same time, but that much of that literature doesn't actually involve the diversification of places in which people are living. It's more a uh, transcending the national boundaries, but along the traditional migration routes. And yet, even 20 years ago, before the transnationalism literature became popular uh, uh, in the UK, uh, Nick Van Heer from Oxford's Compass Centre on Migration observed back in the 1990s that Ghanaian migrants just to take one example, were already spread across nearly 50 nations, diversifying from Britain and then Germany. And in Ghana, uh, people who live in the diaspora are sometimes called um, Hamburgers um, because of the prominence of Ghanaians living in Hamburg, um, uh, something I didn't know until I started working in Ghana. Um, but then also various neighboring countries. Indeed, of course, uh, Ghanaians had been moving to Nigeria uh, and other neighbouring countries uh, alongside moving to uh, Britain and Germany, but also to many other countries and continents, including certainly North America, but also South Africa, the Middle East, and more recently China. So we might ask in this context, as places become more diverse, do individuals' uh, trajectories also become more diverse, so that the aggregate set of migration trajectories become more complex? Um, and can we perhaps call that supermobility? Um, just moving on one slide, and the world according to The Economist, um, the question is, if migration is more diverse and migrants are more diverse, if traditional migration corridors like South Asia or Ireland to the UK or Morocco to France or Turkey to Germany or Mexico to the US are no longer sufficient to characterise typical migration, You'll see The Economist uh, already has many other uh, migration systems in its graphical display, and I would say that that doesn't begin to encompass the complexity of migration flows that we currently have in the world. Then is what we're left with simply complex, lacking order, a form of entropy? Or can we identify new patterns and trends that are amenable to explanation. And in addition, there's the related question, what are the consequences of these super diverse or super mobile patterns for source and destination areas? And that's what I want to try and address uh, in this lecture in the context of both quantitative and qualitative evidence. And I've already mentioned the collaborations, uh, in particular, the MAFE survey, uh, the MAFE project, the logo down here at the bottom, funded by the European Union. This is new survey material from a retrospective longitudinal survey of African migration from three countries, Ghana, Senegal, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in fact, it's from five cities in those three countries. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment. To six European destinations, that's Britain, the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Spain, and Italy. Uh, this project gives us um, a much clearer picture on how African migration to Europe has changed over time, 
and what is driving both migration itself and the way that it is changing. Uh, now, it is just one survey. It's one form of evidence needs to be understood in the context of other evidence, but I think it's a, a very interesting survey. I'm happy to talk more about the nature of the survey in particular, our way of achieving a longitudinal survey through retrospective interviewing, which is a, um, a, a, a technique uh, that is open to some criticism, and indeed is quite heavily criticised by uh, some, but not all of my colleagues in economics, is another discipline that uses and appreciates the value of longitudinal surveys. But it's one way at getting at change over time and one way of producing data on migration that otherwise, frankly, in terms of micro data on migration, is sadly lacking. And as a consequence, um, you know, our uh, understanding is uh, inhibited by the lack of that data. Now I'm going to try and complement that with three detailed cases which were developed by three of uh, my Sussex-based PhD students. Uh, one on the social networks of Pacific Islanders, uh, Tongans, Fijians, also some Maoris from New Zealand, uh, living in London and Toronto. That's uh, Fran Meissner. Another on the gender relations of Ghanaians living in London and back in Accra. Uh, that's Prosper. And the third on what we might call diaspor diasporic engagement by Sierra Leoneans living in London, also informed by a period of fieldwork in Freetown, and that's David. These case studies have actually used techniques that have ranged from multi-sided ethnography through to more formal interviewing, and also, in Fran's case, to network analysis, which I'll uh, speak a little bit more about towards the end of the lecture when I get to her uh, heat maps of homophily. So the lecture at a glance, I realize I've already spoken for quite a bit of time, but here's what I'm planning to do. I'm going to ask, what is the nature of contemporary super diversity and super mobility with specific mention of London and Toronto as destinations and West Africa and the Pacific Islands as origins? I'm going to ask, try to give you some answers indeed on how African migration at least to Europe has changed over the last 30 years and what might explain those changes and whether we are looking at a diversification or not, how we should understand that. Does new African migration, is it simply more diverse or does it have patterns, and if it has patterns, what are those patterns? And then also move to the question of whether mobility propagates diversity, or are there ways in which diversity is held in check by mobility? Are there patterns in diversity? And looking specifically at the Pacific Islanders' case, what are they, and how might this tell us about patterns in diversity more generally? As I say, it is an experimental lecture, I don't know if I'll answer all of those questions, but I'm going to give it a go, and I'll try and conclude by reflecting on what might be uh, important ways of moving forward. So let me come back to the question of what is the nature of contemporary diversity. I've already talked about Steve Vertebeck, and in his 2007 seminal paper, Steve argued that new migration is super diverse because new migrants are diverse across a range of variables, including ethnicity, immigration status, rights and entitlements, labour market experiences, gender and age profiles, and patterns of spatial distribution. Now that's a lot of forms of diversity. And the idea is that this has led to new, smaller and less organised, legally differen differentiated and non-citizen immigrant groups that actually challenges the prevailing framework of multiculturalism, which tends to assume ethnic cultures as the key dividing lines in society. And these, th this, this notion uh, that Steve has put forward has generated, frankly, a lot of interest and not simply interest within the discipline of anthropology that Steve comes from. Uh, for example, there is now a growing uh, literature in sociolinguistics, a field that we do here at SOAS, of course, um, where the study of ling linguistic diversity shows that named languages are perhaps becoming denaturalized and that multilingualism, for some, is becoming the norm. In other words, the predictability of sociocultural free... This, uh, the, uh, start again. The predictability of the sociocultural features of the category migrant are disappearing. So migration might have less salience as a... Um, explanatory factor in understanding what is happening to society. Or indeed, um, completely contrasting work in sociology that has focused on, for example, the internet 
as a space of super, super diversity, whether the internet is taking us beyond citizenship in a different way to something that we might call netizenship. Actually, I hate that word. I hope nobody picks that literature up. The key point here is that in addressing diversity, we need not just to address ethnic diversity, but multiple and overlapping diversities. Having said that, um, and as a broad sweep, it strikes me that whilst this might exist, probably does exist in cities like London, perhaps also Brussels, Amsterdam, a few others, I, I do wonder whether this is really an emerging global phenomenon. Some cities appear to be super diverse for sure. London has multiple origins of migrants, multiple routes of entry, multiple waves of entry, migrants coming with different skill levels, different languages, different religions. The conditions for super diversity are perhaps there in London. But if we look at the other example that we have, uh, for example, in Fran's study, um, which I know a little bit about from visiting and having an, another student work on Toronto, perhaps in Toronto, even in modern Toronto, what we are talking about is still much more classic ethnic diversity. And indeed, notwithstanding Soas's studies of multilingualism in Africa, which of course is not a new phenomenon at all, uh, there seems to be a lack of examples of multi uh, you know, super diversity in Africa and indeed in much of Asia and the Middle East. I'd pose the question, can we think of Singapore or Johannesburg or Dubai as super diverse cities in the way that Steve uh, outlines? Um, one of the problems, I suppose, is that we have not really had the studies that would investigate that. But it's also true, I think, to say that although there has been a lot of interest in the concept of superdiversity, much of the work that has tried to pick up that label and that idea has still fundamentally focused on cultural, uh, ethnic or national diversity and struggled to cope with those multiple different forms of diversity. Um, indeed, I'm not sure that those studies also are able to transcend the binary migration corridors that we're familiar with and that I've mentioned earlier in the lecture. So reflecting on superdiversity, it strikes me that superdiversity is a, uh, an interesting notion, something that is worth exploring, but that something that we are only at the beginning of exploring and that is far from becoming a global phenomenon. If we turn to supermobility, just to say a little bit more about this, uh, you know, should we be celebrating supermobility as well, or should we perhaps be worried? Supermobility, of course, is a concept that has not caught on in quite the same way in the migration and diaspora studies literature as superdiversity has. Uh, it was first coined, I think, uh, um, by Danny Sriskandaraja, uh, Jill Rutter and Maria Latore in a paper for the Institute of Public Policy Research a few years ago. And Actually, it's not so much the concept that I suggested, uh, migration becoming more diverse. It's actually the notion that people are moving to increasingly diverse... Uh, no, sorry, it's not that people are moving to increasingly diverse locations in diverse ways, which is what would be the flip side of super diversity. Rather, in the IPPR study, it's about people being less interested in citizenship in the places that they move to. Uh, so the IPPR report, which is, was titled Beyond Naturalization, Citizenship Policy in an Age of Supermobility, an age of supermobility, no less, published in two, 2008. Um, Danny, I, I love Danny to bits, a great guy for um, a grand statement, which of course is important, but not always uh, completely accurate. Um, they argued that fewer people are interested to take up British citizenship. But that's actually, in some respects, quite a narrow claim and not necessarily a claim that is borne out by the uh, evidence of growing uh, populations of British citizens, naturalised British citizens, living in other parts of the world. Indeed, it strikes me that British citizenship is as popular as ever. There is no move uh, beyond the notion of citizenship, albeit that there is a move beyond the notion that citizenship needs to be enjoyed by living in the country that has provided you with citizenship. So I think that supermobility super is a concept that has some legs, but not necessarily in the context that it was originally coined. Indeed, 
It's been picked up by quite a number of recent studies of immigration to the UK, but prim primarily studies of Polish and other Eastern European immigration to the UK to explore, for example, why Polish people might not want UK citizenship and how the Polish language remains a key unifying force for Polish people who are increasingly mobile. But of course, the Polish case is incredibly specific, the Eastern European case more generally in the UK, because it involves movement in what is essentially a free movement zone where citizenship does not matter. You do not need British citizenship to live uh, you know, a, a life with more or less complete rights in the UK as a Polish citizen. Of course, uh, current changes within the Conservative Party might move us away from that position, but at least at the moment, that is the reality of the situation. Now, if only some places are becoming super diverse, perhaps the diversity of destinations is at least affecting more places. Certainly there are new destinations uh, in the world's migration systems, notably places like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, Hong Kong. I think we can expect a growth of new destinations in Asia as Asian economies take off and indeed in other parts of the world as uh, economies move ahead. There have also been changes with the growth of what one of my uh, former Sussex colleagues, Mike Collier, calls fragmented migration. Complex patterns of movement in which, for example, people moving from Africa to Europe uh, apparently become stuck in places like Morocco or perhaps uh, find that it is better to stay in places like Morocco or indeed Libya, um, or at least at a particular moment in time that it is better to stay in those places than to move on uh, to their original destination. We also need to take into account the growing significance of south-south migration, indeed internal migration, which is a different thing altogether. Um, uh, not my subject here, but uh, I would note that many poorer people are arguably trapped in these kinds of shorter distance, less secure forms of migration, uh, less secure both in the sense of being more seasonal, more uh, subject to disruption uh, over time, and less guaranteed that you can continue to be a migrant but also less secure in the sense that the people who engage in those migration flows are often very vulnerable to uh, a, a variety of economic and uh, political shocks. So to conclude on this, I would say there have been significant changes in patterns of movements, but not a free-for-all. And many barriers to movement, such as political barriers, um, but migration is still very much challenged by the overarching uh, system. Indeed, a recent macro analysis by uh, Hein de Haas at Oxford with his collaborator, um, uh, I've only written the surname down here, which I can't even pronounce, uh, Chaika. Um, anyway, um, a, a very interesting recent working paper, which challenges actually the common idea that there has been a global increase in the volume, diversity, and geographical scope of migration, although they do also note that many small island states in particular have seen increasing dispersion of their populations and that some destinations, interestingly, notably Europe, have witnessed a greater diversity of origins um, from outside Europe itself and also destinations, for example, the shift to uh, southern Europe becoming a destination. So I want to move on and look at this um, in the context of Africa and what I'm going to say next uh, draws on the MAFE longitudinal data collected retrospectively over a 30-year time scale for three African countries. Uh, similar surveys are starting to become available for other countries too, although not all of them, like the MAFE data, uh, are ending up in the public domain. Hopefully such data uh, will help us to overcome some of the problems. I, I, I haven't gone into this, but I think there are some problems with the aggregate country-level data analysis that uh, Hein and his colleague have done, albeit that I think that's a very interesting uh, contribution to the, date, uh, to, the, to the debate. So moving on to some of the MAFE data, let's start with how has Ma African migration changed over the last 30 years and what might explain that change. So we can see from this slide, for example, that in Ghana and Senegal, we've, what we've done here is we've grouped um, migration uh, across three kind of broadly speaking decadal time spans and then we've grouped it uh, into migrations that to other African destinations, migrations to Europe, and migrations to other uh, destinations. 
Um, and we can see that from this that in Ghana and Senegal, the share of first migrations that are to Europe have indeed gone up from about 20% uh, in the 19, uh, uh, late 1970s and 1980s to about 50% uh, in the uh, 2000s in Ghana and from about 30% uh, to about 60% uh, in Senegal. Uh, but in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the proportion of migration going to Europe has actually declined. And in turn, whilst Ghanaian migration has certainly diversified with other destinations growing in line with the observations of Nick Van Heer a few, a few years ago, Senegalese migration has not diversified with other destinations actually uh, declining. Um, just to note, these surveys were carried out, as I said, in five African cities, uh, Kinshasa, Accra, Dakar, uh, Kumasi, and Cape Coast. So what explains some of these differences? What explains the nature of changing um, migration? It's not easy to say. For the three Ghanaian cities that we surveyed, over that period of time, regional opportunities to migrate to Nigeria declined. Indeed, there was a period in which Ghanaian migrants were expelled from Nigeria with uh, political upheaval in the 1970s. And for those living in Dhaka, and Senegal more broadly, the traditional destination of Côte d'Ivoire dried up. In contrast, for those living in Kinshasa, and especially the broader Democratic Republic of Congo, big new opportunities are opened up to move to Angola and South Africa, just as the predominantly asylum route to Europe was becoming more restricted. What is clear, though, is that overall migration in all three of these African countries is increasing. This graph shows the lifetime probability of migration of individuals over that 30-year period. It's growing in all three countries, although growing most in the country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the migrants have been able to go to other African countries. Yet, although the Democratic R Republic of Congo probability to migrate has nearly doubled, the probability of that migration to being, being to Europe has gone from more than a half chance of it being to Europe to just 15% of new first departures being to Europe. I should say all of these for each individual in the survey represent an analysis of their first migration, not subsequent migrations, which are, of course, in some sense linked to the first migrations and therefore not independent events. So this is not really contributing to super diversity in Europe, nor really is it evidence of super mobility. The lifetime probability of even those most positioned to move in these big, uh, large cities in Africa is still quite low. And even this growth in migration that I've shown here needs to be interpreted carefully. For example, there are, there's other literature that suggests that uh, the growth in migration from Africa at the moment can be seen as a particular stage in Africa's development. What there is, though, is a considerable amount of diversity within these movements. And just to move on to look at um, some of this from the position of the destinations. And also, I would argue, helps us to understand this uh, emergence of diversity where it is as something that has meaning and explanation and not simply as some form of entropy. So specifically, movement to the colonial metropoles has always been, and much of it remains, more legal, i.e. people arrive with a right to remain, and more skilled in nature, especially Ghanaians coming to the UK and Congolese going to Belgium. Indeed, it's worth recalling that another IPPR study a few years ago called Beyond Black and White, uh, which contributed much to public discussion of diversity, showed that the most educated fractions of British society were indeed those who were born in West Africa, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and so on. In contrast, the new flows, the growth of migration from Africa to Europe, is not a diversification of a particular flow to new destinations. It's a genuinely new flow. New flows that are in general more clandestine, the arrival of Congolese in the UK to seek asylum, or less skilled, the Senegalese coming to it Italy, or indeed also um, Congolese coming to, to UK, are less skilled than the Congolese going to, to uh, the Netherlands or Ghanaians coming to the UK. Britain in particular has been particularly attractive for its skilled migrants because of its education sector. Let's not forget that students are, in statistical terms at least, another migrant group. 
Um, if we move on to a, a f another way of explaining this change, and I, I don't know how much of this you'll be able to read, but let me just quickly talk you through it. Uh, the key conclusions are on the right there anyway. Um, this is a logistic regression analysis we've done to test the argument that education is a significant factor in explaining the changes in migration. What this shows is that education, and especially tertiary education, is a key correlate of whether individuals move or not. And the only other really significant correlate, apart from age, which we know uh, it is clearly important, although interestingly it's uh, not shown as important in the regressions for Congo, uh, the only other really significant correlate is having relatives already in Europe, uh, who of course can sponsor a legal move or facilitate an illegal one. And in contrast, wealth shows much more patchy correlations where it is important at all. Um, those who are generally better off uh, move in Congo. Those who have assets move in Senegal. Uh, uh, macroeconomic conditions, on the other hand, are generally not important. At least uh, we've only tested macroeconomic conditions in the country of origin. Um, and one of the things that I like to put into this regression uh, bearing in mind that this is a multi-level regression, I'd like to add in the macroeconomic conditions in the destination. And my hunch would be that if we put that into the model, that will show up as quite significant. And indeed, if David Cameron ever asked me for advice on how to reduce immigration, what I would probably say is, um, if you destroy the economy, immigration will probably collapse. <laughs> uh, of course, he's gone some way to doing that already anyway. Um, in other words, looking across the last 30 years in at least three African countries, there is little or no correlation between poverty and international migration. And insofar as we have some more diversity in Britain from the arrival of greater numbers of Africans, it is not because the continent is uh, poor, um, nor indeed does it look, um, as uh, the eminent economists Hatton and Williamson would argue, that, that African migration will grow if Africa becomes less poor. Um, I've spent a lot of time, probably too much time, uh, on introductions and the changing nature of African migration to Britain. Let me move swiftly on to some of the more qualitative evidence uh, and uh, the super diversity stuff. Um, is there a relationship between migration and diversity? And does the experience of people being in a super diverse place lead to new and more diverse outcomes? My first case study is that of David Ribbon and Ling in East Street Market in Woolworth. Um, uh, this asks the question, what is the nature of the intergroup encounter, encounter in a super diverse market space, uh, a space that has, for example, Afghan grocery stores, Kurdish fruit and vegetable stores, Chinese medicine, Caribbean music, Nigerian snack foods, as well as English traders selling secondhand clothes, fresh fish, perfume and children's toys. Obviously, there is much scope here for diverse encounters. But what do these intergroup encounters mean for the emergence of cross-cultural relationships? Does super diversity matter? The literature actually so far on this suggests that it doesn't matter that much. Indeed, although we might think, and the Home Office has argued, that contact between many different nationalities in such places leads to improved social cohesion. Actually, that was the Home Office under the last government. I'm not sure that the current Home Office thinks the same thing. Um, Valentine has shown, in contrast, how this civility in public space is often based on social expectations of politeness that don't necessarily relate to a love of dis distance and indeed can be a mask for more negative, ambivalent feelings ranging from indifference to out outright hostility. Indeed, Armin has argued that positive encounters are limited to spaces where interaction is compulsory, such as the workplace, sports clubs and arts projects, where there remains much less diversity in interaction. Uh, and Lawrence suggests that increasing diversity can, for those without strong inter-ethnic ties already, actually have adverse effects on inter-ethnic evidence. If I turn to David's evidence, focusing on three traders in East Street Market, one British, one Sierra Leone and one Afghan, shows how they play the diversity game, but are fundamentally drawing on very traditional conceptions of what it is to be British or African or Afghan, and in the latter two cases, selling a conception of home that is more traditional in many respects than the homeland itself. The notion of uh, Sierra Leonean in East Street Market, David argues, is more Sierra Leonean uh, 
than Sierra Leoneans in Sierra Leone understand Sierra Leonean to be, um, if that makes sense. Um, yet there is a point of contact between them as traders, um, and that does, as Vertivex suggests, override ethnic dif differences. And indeed, David found that there are other lines of connection, such as religion between the Sierra Leonean and the Afghan, uh, who are both Muslim. Whilst on religion, it's also worth noting that another part of David's work with Sierra Leoneans focused quite a lot on re religious sites and religious observance, where there was an interesting convergence of Christian and Islamic beliefs with a highly porous boundary between the two. So some, um, some moulding of cultures in a real super diversity way, um, although indeed, uh, I don't know if she's here, but I understand this is also a feature of um, Janssen's work here at SOAS on Chrislam in Lagos. Um, not perhaps usually viewed as a super diverse city, although of course it is a city that's had in migration from many different parts of Nigeria and Africa more broadly and in which perhaps the same processes are going on. Um, moving quickly, another case study is uh, that of Ghanaians in the UK, this through time through a qualitative study of gender relations in a variety of sites conducted by Prosper. Here we're not talking about similar people from different places, but dissimilar people, men and women, from the same place. The evidence of Prosper is, again, that contact with new experiences and diverse groups of people um, does lead to change, but it does not necessarily lead or really lead to a greater diversity of attitudes or to a substantial amount of cultural or social transformation. So traditional Ghanaian gender roles are challenged by contact with many different people and in particular uh, by the different uh, prospects for Ghanaian men and women in the UK labour market. Uh, so women in the diaspora often encounter more opportunities in a super diverse city such as London, uh, but men experience disempowerment where their opportunities are narrowed somewhat and certainly their relative opportunity compared to women is much reduced. But he also found that this is not experienced on the whole as an enduring change. Uh, return amongst this group does not lead uh, to a perpetuation of those changed realities once people are back in Ghana. If this is true, that a super diverse context does not necessarily lead to diverse views, perspective, actions, this begs the question why. And one way of exploring this is to look at patterns of sociality among migrants. In other words, how do people interact with each other? And this is what Fran has tried to do in relation to Pacific Islanders. And if you were confused by the logistic regression page, uh, here goes another one. Um, Fran's thesis um, has tried to ask whether there are patterns in diversity, which is kind of what I've been talking about. Um, and looking specifically at the Pacific Islanders case, what might they be and what might this tell us about patterns in diversity more generally? Fran's thesis developed from the notion that superdiversity demands a move beyond ethnically focused analysis, as I was saying, and yet we seem often unable to move in that direction, falling back on ethnic diversity by some proxy, for example, religion or language. Taking London and Toronto as the locations for her study, she used personal social network analysis to look at how diverse are the networks of migrants. She made it a little bit more challenging as well by looking at migrants who in statistical terms are categorized as other in all statistical analyses, people from the Pacific Islands um, and the nature of the networks in London then led her also to include New Zealand Maoris in this analysis. So the graphic here shows visually the level of homophily, i.e. sameness, for a series of networks. Each of the columns here is a different network with a, with a label. And uh, I don't know if I can make this work. Uh, no, I can't. Oh, maybe I can. Uh, can I make this work? It needs an internet connection. This is on the, um, the website of the Institute of Religious Diversity in Göttingen, which Steve Vertovec runs, in which we, Steve and I were Fran's co-supervisors in this work. So, um, actually, this is rubbish because it just uh, it, how it's supposed to be is that you move your cursor over and you see the figures come up one by one. I'm going to get rid of that and go back to the presentation. Um, 
But anyway, each of these shadings shows a level of homophily. Um, uh, so each column is a different network centered around an interviewed migrant. What it shows is that there are a proportion of networks that share the characteristics of being composed of mostly or all migrants, but also others that include non-migrants. So you know, if you take migrant as a measure of homophily, there are all of these networks are, have a homophily value of one. In other words, they are networks where everybody in the network is a migrant. But there are plenty of other people who have networks where uh, you know, fewer and fewer people are migrants. Uh, actually, this is not necessarily that they're migrants. This is sameness in relation to the category of migrant. So it could be that they have a homophily value of one because the network is composed entirely of non-migrants. But I think they're mostly entirely of migrants. Um, so the same is true is uh, true for many other dimensions of diversity measured. But importantly, there is relatively little overlap between these networks in terms of the degree of homophily with the exception that there is some overlap between networks that included lots of people who had been in the city for similar amounts of time and networks that included lots of people of the same visa category. So um, there is some degree of networks, for example, here's a network where migrant, whether they're migrants, how long they've been in the city and what their visa category is all the same. Here's another network that where all three of those are the same, another one. So there is some clustering of networks that share all of those characteristics, but otherwise um, not that much clustering of diversity across different dimensions. And this is a mechanism for displaying that diversity of diversities. Indeed, it's not the case that the longer people have been in the city, more the, the more likely networks are to include migrants and non-migrants. Um, so this analysis is more supportive of the idea of superdiversity, and importantly, it suggests very firmly uh, that there, but importantly, its relational analysis suggests very firmly that there is not much of a relationship <coughs> between diversity itself and diverse forms of mobility. Okay, so let me try and sum up. Superdiversity is a phrase that is entering the academic canon. It's moved beyond its discipline of origin and it points to a process that is both distinct and arguably growing. We also clearly have a world in which migration is still increasing as a phenomenon. In other words, people are becoming more mobile, even if supermobile doesn't quite capture it and indeed wasn't really coined with that in mind. Yet it is difficult to, ana to analyse superdiversity and all too easy to slip back into the analysis of ethnic diversity only, or some pro pro uh, proxy for ethnic diversity. Moreover, when we put superdiversity and growing mobility together, it is all too easy to conclude that old patterns are breaking down and that the world is simply getting more complex. But that is not necessarily true. And indeed, for some that might be fine if we think of biodiversity, for example, as an analogy. Biodiversity is complex to understand, but at, another but at another level, profoundly simple. The more diverse and complex an ecosystem, the more resilience it has, the more chances of adaptation to change, evolution and progress. That's why we think biodiversity is, in principle, a good thing. Yet for others, as I alluded to right at the start, that complexity is a challenge. If we look at the debate about immigration to Britain, although it has in the last couple of years become genuinely poisonous, for a long time there was a popular discourse not against immigration per se, nor really about fears about immigrants taking our jobs or put, putting burdens on our health care. I mean, after all, many of our doctors are immigrants. Rather, it was a perception that it was somehow out of control, a perception, indeed, that talk of superdiversity or supermobility feeds into. But my takeaway message is that we can start to understand that complexity and we should. Of course, qualitative social science has always looked to understand complexity and still does. But it's often better at challenging stereotypes than it is at providing alternative synthesizing narratives. What is new, I think, is the development of quantitative techniques and better, the availability of new data, longitudinal data, 
that enables us to draw more general conclusions without having to make assumptions that are so colossal that they impede rather than aiding understanding. The case studies that I've highlighted include two pieces of classic, albeit multi-sided, qualitative research, but they also include two more quantitative examples that I think are quite exciting for the future study of migration, mobility and diversity. The first, post personal social network analysis and the associated graphical representations of network diversity, of which I've frankly only scratched the surface. These can be applied to other more complex, or dare I say more representative cases than the Pacific Islanders and Maoris that were the subject of what I've talked about here. And second, multi-level multi event history analysis, which holds out the prospect not just of understanding what explains migration in the first place, but also, and I haven't talked about this at all, uh, the extent to which migrant trajectories are changing and why, and what the implications are to vibe for diverse places of destinations. Both are developments that I hope to be associated with in the future, and I hope that you'll share at least some of my enthusiasm for thinking about them. Thank you for listening.